Thanks for coming to the session. Before I begin, a couple questions. First off, how many of you currently use Google Analytics? So it looks like 50, 75%, somewhere in there. And of those of you, how many of you use Google Analytics for mobile apps? Almost the same percentage, maybe 30%, something like that. All right, so for, the, for those of you who don't use Google Analytics at all, it's a way of providing anonymized, aggregated data about the usage of your software. And we're going to see that in much more detail. For those of you who use analytics but don't use it for mobile yet, I hope that this really shows you how mobile can be quite useful with analytics. And for those of you who are already using Google Analytics with mobile, I think you're going to be really excited about what we have to show you about the new features, new announcements. So my name is Neil Roth. I'm tech lead for the mobile analytics SDK. And I'm really happy to show you what we've been working on for the last nine months. About two years ago, we released an SDK for mobile analytics. But it wasn't really a great solution. So Google Analytics has been really designed in the past for websites. And really what we said to you when we provided this SDK was, you can go ahead and use analytics for mobile applications. However, you have to pretend you're a website. Right? You pretend you're a website. We will pretend you're a website. And we're not going to really give you anything application specific. So how does that pretense work, or how did it work? Well, for one thing, when you signed up an account, you had to provide the URL of your website until recently. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a URL for my mobile application. So you had to fake one. Another example, all the terminology was web-centric. We use terminology like visit and visitors. I don't have visitors to my application. I have users. And they don't have visits. We have maybe sessions. I don't have page views. I have screens. And also, I have information that's specific to applications. Things like versions, application name, things like, well, crashes. Right? That happens. And it's information you want to find out about. So what we're announcing today, what we have announced today, really, is mobile applications as first-class citizens of Google Analytics. Right? Announcing Google Mobile App Analytics. Thank you. So this is available in beta. We're taking people in via whitelist, and we're going to be allowing those people to enter the beta in waves. And we expect to have everyone who's using analytics available to use mobile apps by the end of summer. I'll talk a little bit later about how you sign up for this whitelist. So mobile applications. When you're developing a mobile application, we saw a number of sessions this week okay, about development. Actually, let me add one more thing. When I say mobile applications, did I say Android applications? No, I said the word mobile, right? Because this includes both Android and iOS. So when you're developing applications, you go ahead and develop them, and then you market those applications through a variety of ways. So you might have paid advertising, email marketing campaigns, Google search, and so on, so SEO type things. and then my favorite part, next to the analysis, is monetizing, right? How do you make money on this application? We had sessions on that as well this week. What we're focusing on is the third part, the measuring and iterating. That is measuring how well your development has worked, how well your marketing and monetizing are working, and then improving those and iterating on them. For development, some of what you can measure are the sad thing I mentioned earlier, crashes. Okay. Also measure how people are using your application, whether they're particular screens that are not used very much or options that are not used very much, or screens that are confusing to users and they leave your application. So by measuring that, you can then go and iterate and make a better product. You can measure your marketing. 
what happens when users come into your application via different channels? How do they act within the application? How well do they monetize and so on? We'll look at some of this in more detail. We break apart, really, three different areas of measurement. So one is acquisitions. Where are your users coming from? Are they coming because an email marketing campaign drove them to Google Play, for example? Are they coming because they're doing a search on Google for various keywords? Are they coming because of various advertising campaigns? And it's important to get that information. You want to spend your money wisely if you're doing advertising campaigns. A second is engagement. Once the users actually get there and are using your application, how are they using it? What screens are they using in your application? For how long? How do users move within your application from screen to screen? That nasty word app crashes again. So we may want to know information about app crashes, like what is the crash, of course, but also where is it occurring within your application? What kinds of devices it is occurring on? What operating system versions? What versions of your application is it happening in? Events. Think of screens as sort of the where in your application, and events as the what that's happening. So you can add code to your application to track specific events that are occurring. Things like, for instance, the user choosing uh, a particular preference item. Let, let, let me pick a specific example. Let's say you have a menu item to carry out some, some task. What percentage of your users use that menu item? Do you have any idea? Is it 1%? Is it 50%? How many users don't even know there are menus? Probably a fair number, right? And so by causing an event to be tracked when a menu is chosen, you can have some idea of how often that's used. Maybe it would be simpler not to have that menu event at all. Or maybe it happens so often, you want to make sure actually make that happen on screen. So that's acquisition, where do users come from? Engagement, what do they do when they get there? And then outcome. Okay. So we have several outcomes. One outcome is certainly monetization. What sales do you have of your application? What ad revenue do you have? What in-app purchases do you have? And I want to look at that information and slice it and dice it in various different ways, like per country, for example, or in a number of different ways that we're going to see. We also have the idea of goal conversions. So you can set up a goal within your application of like reaching a particular screen or having some particular event happen and see how users get to that conversion, how many of those happen, and so on. So now let's look at a demo. So here I am, and I'm going to create a new account. So I've got an application that I want to do tracking for. And what do I want to track? Well, what we see is a first-class object, our application. So we have a website, yes. And if, if we had a website, we would need to know its URL, of course. But we're not a website. We're an application we're going to be tracking. So no need for URL. Our application actually has a name. Uh, this is uh, Neil's app, let's say. and my account, and then I can go ahead and get a tracking ID. First, I've got to agree to the terms of service. My Evelyn Wood speed reading class comes in handy, and yes, that all looks reasonable. And now I get a tracking ID. So this is the ID UA dash number, 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 dash number, that I'm going to use within my application to specify that it's for this account that I am tracking information. From here, I can easily download the SDK, so the Android SDK or the iOS SDK in a single link. I have references to the documentation from here. A lot of folks monetize their application using AdMob, and so if you use AdMob, we have a single download that actually combines both the AdMob and Analytics SDKs. 
one fewer thing to download. So I've created this account, but I'm not going to actually use it right now, because since I just created it, there's no data there. Instead, I'm going to look at a different account. So this is for an application I call Acme Travel. It's an application that's used for searching and booking hotel and flights. And in the overview, we provided what we hope are the most useful graphs and dashboards that you'd want for looking at this. And we've organized it in these three ways again. Acquisitions. So here we see how many new users and active users per day, where they're coming from, what device model. Engagement. How long are they using your, your application? How many screens per usage or per session? What screens are the most common? And then outcomes. Goal completions. And as I mentioned, my, mo my favorite in-app revenue. So I can see revenues were going up slightly, and then I had a sudden drop, but that was made up for by a nice peak. So graphs and numbers are nice, but that is not the reason for analytics. Instead, the reason is to have act find information so that you can take action. Look at an example. So Google Play Sources. I can see, again, the acquisition. How did my users get to my application? So this source and medium tells me, Google and CPC tells me basically this is an AdWords campaign. I also have an email campaign. Mobile display is an ad mob campaign. So this was not me monetizing my app but instead me as an advertiser trying to drive users to my application. Organic search in, Google, in, in uh, Google doing a search that led to going to Google Play. And other AdWords campaign, or sorry, other advertising campaigns as well. And from each of those, I can find out how many users, how many new users I got, how many sessions those users had, the duration of those sessions, and the in-app revenue. This is the information that we provide you directly. You can certainly make customer reports and slice and dice information how you want. What do I get from this actionable? Well, I see, for example, that my AdWords campaign had 10 new users with an average session duration of 35 seconds, and they spent a total of $2,493. This is probably an exceptionally good AdWords campaign, actually, with an average of $250 per user. My email campaign did fairly well. I had six new users. So if, actually, if I just looked at users, 10 new users in my AdWords campaign, six new users in my email campaign, well, that says that the AdWords campaign is about 50% better than the other one, right? But the cohort of people coming in are actually different. That is, their behavior is different depending on how they got there. Why might that be? Maybe the people who came in via my AdWords campaign, I had a particularly compelling ad that, that only people who are quite qualified would click on. And maybe my e email campaign was somewhat less directed, and I had more sort of random people coming in. But in any case, I can see how well my ad worked with respect to the money I got. Okay. And here, clearly, the AdWords campaign went well. We'll take questions at the end. But do save that question. All right. Let's look at another question I have. So this application is in English. I have enough money, I have enough budget to translate it into a single language to localize it, and unfortunately only one. As I look at this chart, I see that English is certainly my predominant use. So this is people whose devices are set to use English. But I also have people who are using it in German and Spanish and French. Now again, the application is in English, but they're on a device that's set up for German, Spanish, or French. And as I look at the numbers here, my natural inclination would be to say, German is obviously the language to which I should translate next, because that's the most number of users. But if 
look more carefully, dive into the numbers a little deeper, I see that the behavior of the users using German is quite different from the ones who are using Spanish. In particular, the screens per session is two for German, which is very close to the English of 2.09, whereas in Spanish it's only 1.38. If I look at the session duration, it's actually longer in German than it is for English users, but in Spanish it's five seconds. Here's what that tells me. Here's the story that I get from that. I could be wrong. This is my interpretation. German users, at least of this application, are willing to use it in English. They're willing to use it for just as long as English users. Spanish users are not. Okay? They open the application and they leave pretty quickly. So this says to me that although I might affect more users if I translate it to German, I'm actually going to improve the life more if I translate to Spanish, because the German users are OK with it, and the Spanish users are not. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's look at an overview of devices and networks. Again, to try and get some actionable information. Top network operators, not that useful to me, although it does tell me, since we're using Sprint as the top network operator, that people are mostly using this via cell connection and not via Wi-Fi. So that's useful information. Key information here for me is the OS versions. So I see that Android 4.0 is the largest set of people using my app. Android 2.1 behind that. iOS just behind that iOS 5, and then some other versions of Android and iOS. So what this says to me is that the majority of people who are using iOS are using iOS 5. And in fact, I wouldn't lose too much of my iOS users if I required iOS 5 as a minimum version. Doing that might allow me to take advantage of iOS 5 features okay, and make my life a little easier because I didn't have to support iOS 4. On the other hand, that wouldn't make sense, according to these numbers, for my particular users for Android. If I required Android 4 as a minimum, I would lose a lot of my existing users. So that says to me, if I want to support Android 4 features, I need to make sure to do so in a way such that my application will still run on earlier devices. I can see the device models, and that's useful. Screen resolution is another thing that can be important. Right? If I know what percentage of people are using what screen sizes, this tells me a fair number of people are using large resolution devices, high resolution devices. And so therefore, it might make sense for me to invest in some higher resolution artwork, because my artwork right now is fairly low res. So let's move now from acquisition to engagement. I can see information like what screens people are using, what events are occurring. One thing that's really interesting is engagement flow. So this tells me how people move within my application from screen to screen. This particular application doesn't have very many screens. It's a fairly simplistic application. But what I see is, so this is telling me on the left, the people coming in using the Android version of the app, and the people coming in using the iOS version of the app, and I get to see how many of them go, start at the search screen. So the vast majority of them start at the search screen. And then the red here on the right is the drop off. How many of them leave the application by going to the search screen and then leaving? So we have some number, about 8% drop off. The rest of them are moving over to the results page. Say I want to narrow down just what are the Android users doing. In this case, I see most of them go onto the search page, but a small portion of them just go into the login page, and then, kind of weird, go directly into the results page. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, and that might make me want to look into my application a little bit. So this tells me the where of how people move within my application. What we've also got 
is ability to look at not only the where, but also what's occurring as well. So I can look at a combination of screens and events. Let me start at the results page. So I can see that the results page, from there I go to the preferences or the book page somewhat, but then I also go to these blue events. So I can see the interaction that's occurring in my application by users between screens and between also screens and actions. Crashes. So we differentiate between crashes and exceptions. Or rather, exceptions are a superset of crashes because we also have exceptions that occur that are not fatal. So crashes are fatal exceptions. And unfortunately, this application, we have some crashes. Our 1.1 version has four crashes. Our 1.2 version has 13. So that might say to us, that's not good. I mean, it's not good to have crashes, right? I'd like to have number zero there. Might say just our 1.2 version got worse than our 1.1. Or maybe it says we have a lot more usage of our 1.2 application. We can investigate that a little further. We have versions of our application for both iOS and Android in 1.1, and we introduced 1.2. It's interesting if I add some information to this and look at the operating system. And what I see is it's actually segregated. The 1.1 version of the application only has crashes on Android. And there are none in the 1.2 version of Android. So that says I had a problem there, and I fixed it. Unfortunately, what happened on iOS? Apparently, I was doing great there, and I added a bug. Okay. Well, it wasn't me. It was my partner. I don't add bugs. So. I'm the one that fixed the 1.2 version of Android. Some of the other reports we can see and how this is useful. So this is loyalty. How many times does a particular user use your application? So there are some users that use it once. And this is during the time period of interest that we're looking at. Some people use it between 50 and 100 times. It's useful to know how many people use it, but it's also useful to know how that affects other parts. How does that affect your monetization? In this case, how does it affect your goal conversion? Okay. If we look at the goal conversion here, I see that about session six, I get a big bump in my goal conversion from 77% to 92%. So this may be because users become more comfortable with my application and then are willing to go ahead and go to this conversion, which in my case involves buying something. So Maybe it's important to try and help drive people to use it more so that they become comfortable so that they will then monetize you. All right. And actually, the final one I want to show you is the e-commerce. And this, I don't have any ac anything actionable right this instant but I love to see how much money I make, okay? And I can see how much money I make for each of my products. In this case, I'm selling round trip air tickets. And so I can see that I'm selling a lot for some reason between Ontario and Boston. Okay. I might look into that and see how I can sell even more. So what have we seen? What we've seen is the introduction into GA of mobile apps as a first class citizen. So we've seen the sign-up flow, and the new reporting. Next, what I'd like to look at is how you actually add this to your application. To begin with, let's look at the architecture. And let's look at the architecture of a website. Right, so you've got a website to which you are adding analytics. What happens is you have a web page that includes GA, Google Analytics.js, so JavaScript. And this JavaScript will has an API on it, and you can then track various things, including events and page views and so on, and those get sent down to the cloud there, which is the Google Analytics backend. Okay, and it's very straightforward and simple. 
It's a little more complicated in the mobile case. First off, you're not downloading JavaScript dynamically, right? Instead, you have an SDK that's linked with your application. That SDK will then accept tracking calls from your application. And unfortunately, it can't send them directly to our back end for a couple reasons. Give me one reason. What's that? Power is a good reason. So we, did, we wouldn't want every time you switch screen to be powering up the radio and sending out hits across the internet. The second reason is if we, even if we did power up the radio, maybe there's nothing there, right? You're on an airplane or in a tunnel or something else. So we don't necessarily have interne internet connectivity. And even if we did, it's not clear we want to be using it immediately. So instead, we queue those hits in a local database, and then those get dispatched on a periodic basis. As well, you can request a dispatch manually. So if you're already making some connection to the network, that's a good time to request a manual dispatch, because we can then piggyback on top of your connection, okay, which is good for battery life. So let's look at the steps you need to take in order to add analytics. And there are really four basic ones to get started. We'll talk of, in, in a moment, of additional things you can do. So these four steps are to add the jar file to your project, and in this case, I'm going to be talking mostly about the Android, although some asides about iOS specific. For iOS, don't add a jar file, OK? For iOS, add a .h and a .a file. So we first add the jar file. And actually, I'm going to talk about this somewhat briefly, because I'm going to go through a live demo of this. The second thing is add a configuration file. On iOS, you're going to actually be doing this in code. And the reason for that is in iOS, it's very, you have a, a, a single place when your application gets started. You can go ahead and do initialization. For Android, your application starts because some activity starts. And so we don't want to have to duplicate that code with every activity. So instead, we provide an XML file with configuration information that we read from. So the most important configuration piece is that tracking ID you got when you created the account, UA dash number, 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 dash number. The second thing I always like to turn on for development is GA debug. Okay, so turning that on will provide additional debugging information to the console so that you actually know analytics is working, things are happening. The third thing is auto activity tracking, and this is specific to Android. If your application is designed as a set of activities, each of which roughly corresponds to a screen, as the travel application was, then you would want to turn this on. And so as a user switches from activity to activity, we will automatically track those as different screens. I'll talk a little bit later on cases where that wouldn't make sense. And the final thing we're turning on here is reporting uncaught exceptions. This will install an uncaught exception handler, what I think of as an exception handler of last resort, right? which will then take an exception that is about to abort your application, and then go ahead and track that and send it to Google Analytics. There are a couple of other configuration you can do as well, and they're documented. So that's number two. Number three, update your manifest. The most important two things are set up permissions, right? You need to be able to connect to the internet, so you need to set that permission. And we need to know what the network state is, so you need to set that as well. I've mentioned the fact that analytics provides information about where you're coming from the application. Okay? So, sorry, how your application gets installed, how users go into Google Play. And, in or, and then Google Play has to provide information to analytics. And that's done with an install receiver. So there is a notification that's made when Google Play installs your app. We handle that notification, grab this campaign information, and then we'll send it the first time the user uses your application. The final thing you need to do is actually add some code. You need to tell analytics that they're starting. So in every one of your activities, you need to override on start and on stop and call analytics SDK. We do provide a tracked activity class that just does exactly this. 
So if you want to just subclass from that, that's fine as well. So what I'd like to do is a quick demo of actually doing this just to show you kind of how simple it is. So I am going to create a new Android project from one of the samples that ships with the SDK. I'm going to use the notepad example. Right. And step one was to go ahead and add the jar file. So I'm going to go ahead and create a libs directory. which already exists, which is quite odd, since I just created this from scratch. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a new Android project, and I'm going to name it Notepad2. <laughs> and I'm sure that'll solve all the problems. Because I'm quite suspicious when code suddenly appears there automatically. And there's no libs directory there. So that's looking better. So I have a libs directory. And I'm going to go ahead and drag over my jar file. And that's step one I need to do. Step two I need to do is I actually need to tell Eclipse to go ahead and use that jar file as part of the class path. So I'm going to configure the build path, add the jar file. OK. That's step one done. Step two, I said, was we need to create an XML file for configuration. So I'm going to create a folder for that. Create an XML file. You can call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it analytics.xml. And it's going to have values. And then go ahead and add the values I want. So I'm going to add a string, which is the tracking ID. So GA underscore tracking ID. And now I need to remember my UA. So thank goodness I have it hidden away in a text file. The other things I need to add, unfortunately, the visual editor doesn't work for. So I need to add a Boolean, which is GADebug. We'll set that to true. Uh, I had another Boolean, which was, let's see, we want to auto activity tracking. I could do the uncut exceptions, but I happen to know the notepad doesn't have any exceptions. The last thing I need to do is I want, for de debugging purposes only, to adjust the dispatch period. And I just want to make it 15 seconds so I can actually quickly see these hits go out. Okay? We would not ever want to ship with this, because that would basically just keep the radio active most of the time. So that was step two. Step three is the manifest. And in the manifest, I need to add my two permissions. So the first permission I'm going to add is accessing the network state. And the second permission I want to add is being able to access the internet. And what's the final thing I said we need to do? And I'm not going to put in the install receiver now, because I'm not actually planning on installing this via Google Play. Okay. The last thing is code. I'm going to go into the notes list. And I need to override on start and on stop. You guys feel free to tell me if I make any typos. OK, so that's my on start. My on stop looks very similar, except we say stop instead of start.
there are three activities in this application. For the other two, they just subclass activity. I'm going to go ahead and subclass tracked activity. As I mentioned, that's exactly the same thing. It just overrides that on start and on stop. And the title editor is the final one. Import it. And I think we're good to go. So let's go ahead and run this application. Okay, so we can see it's uploading it onto the emulator. You know, that reminds me of something. While this is running, I want to go back to the analytics reports because there's one report I intended to show you that I forgot. And that is a report that uh, started coming out last year, I believe, which is real time. And I want you to know that real time works for applications as well. So, switching away a second, I, I want to have an application that uses real time. This notepad is going to have one user. My Acme uh, application doesn't have really any right now, but there's one that you all have, which is the IO app. So if you all pull out your phones and pull out the Google I.O. app, the Google I.O. app right now has 210 users. Okay? We see, and as you use it, and go ahead and sync. So what happens with the Google I.O. app is it doesn't actually send the hits back to analytics until it's actually syncing so that it can piggyback and do that. So you're going to see more and more users coming on here as you start using the application. So 215 applica 216 users. Most of them are using the agenda, which is not surprising. But there are other people in various other screens. Most of them Friday screens, which is not surprising again. Not using Thursday, not using Wednesday. So this allows you to see how many users are using your mobile application in this case, in the last 30 minutes, and in this case, in the last minute. If we go back to the notepad, I can see in the log that we actually have hits being sent. So I can see this get, and I get to see actually what the particulars of the hit that's being sent. So that's my indication that this is working correctly. I'd really like to be able to see this, so for some reason, I can't unlock this, but I know the notepad actually opened. You can actually also, this is a useful use of real time. So in this case, this is the notepad, real time. And I get to see, I have one user of about four minutes ago, which is when I first launched the application, even though we can see it in the emulator. So that's a good way you can quickly verify that your application is getting information back to analytics. Okay. So we've seen today what we have. We've seen the reports. We've seen how you add analytics to your application. There's other code you might want to add to your application. Tracking views manually. All right. This would be the case if you have, let's say, a game application where you have a single activity and users are moving from level to level in your game. So you would want to call track view as they enter a new level. Or if you've got your application organized as an activity with a variety of fragments, as users display one fragment or another fragment, you'd want to track view. Event. I talked about sort of the what is happening in your application. We have a three-level hierarchy of strings, as well as a value associated with each event. E-commerce. So if you have any sort of e-commerce in your application, as we did in the travel app, you can record it here. Basically, transactions consisting of one or more items, each of which can have their own quantity and price. Exceptions. So. You can use the uncaught exception handler, or you can catch your own exceptions 
In this case, the false means it's not fatal. And we actually, you can either provide the raw exception, in which case we will summarize it for you, or you can provide a textual description on your own. And finally, timing. Timing can be really useful to optimize your application and the user's experience of that application. So you might want to keep timing, for instance, of how long it takes to sync your application to your back end, or how long it takes to load a new level in your game, and then get that information in your reports and find that there may be some outliers that you want to go fix. So I've seen what we have today. Let me look at an upcoming feature that I'm really excited about. And that is integration with Google Play. When you're creating an account, you have the option of linking that to a Google Play account. We will show you then all of the applications you have in that Google Play account. You probably don't have Gmail and YouTube, but we at Google do. Okay, so you'll see your icons for your applications, and you can then link an application to your account. How is that useful? Well, we have a report that shows you how users are getting, you've already seen how users get to your application, right? We now have some extra information that we can show about how many users make it to your page in Google Play, and of those, how many actually download the application. Because there's definitely a difference there, right? You've got people who go to Google Play, see your page, and decide, nah, this isn't for me. You can see how people differentially download based on how they're coming in. Right? Are they coming in via Google search? Are they coming in via AdWords? And so on. So this can allow you to optimize your campaigns, as well as optimize your Google Play page. What might you do? You might adjust your screenshots. You might adjust your copy. And you might find you want to get better reviews by whatever means you can do that. One more thing. I'd like to go ahead and bring Nick up on board. He wants to show you something else that's really exciting in the space of analytics and mobile applications. Thanks, Neil. Uh, my name is Nick Mihailovsky. Uh, where's the clicker? Thank you. All right, I'm going to get you guys awake because I know it's late in the day, and analytics is probably, uh, you know, for me, it's one of my favorite subjects. So, my name is uh, Nick Mihailovsky. I'm a developer programs engineer on analytics. I'm really excited here uh, to talk about one more thing that we have. Now, typically, most people who use Google Analytics log into the web interface and view their data. But what happens if you're away from your desk, like if you're traveling, and you want to view your data on the go? You know, in the past, it's been difficult. The experience hasn't been that great. You either have to go and boot up your computer, or you're going to have to go and go to your mobile device and look at the browser, and the experience wasn't optimized until today. Today, we're launching, <laughs> woo! That's right. Today, we're launching a new Google Analytics mobile application that allows you to view your data directly from your Android device. Now, if all things work well, it's, uh, yeah. if all things work well, I'm going to try to show you a demo from my device. So let's see if uh, the Wi Fi cooperates here. All right. Hopefully nobody calls me either. All right. Um, so here I'm log. Uh, here I have an uh, analytics app on the phone. I'm going to turn it on. Uh, and the first thing what we do is we show you a list of all the profiles that you have access to. Uh, and so what the demo I'm going to give you today is with the Google I/O app, the same one that Neil showed you a little bit earlier on. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And the first thing we show you is the dashboard. This is a quick way for you to view your key performance metrics. Now, what's nice about this dashboard is it's completely customizable. So right here, the default view will show you the total number of active users for the I.O. app. And notice how the number of active users has increased 
because everybody's using the app at I.O. Now what I could do is click this plus button, and now I have a full list of different metrics I could use to add to this dashboard. Now I'm really interested in crashes. Crashes should not happen on an app, especially when everybody's using it. So let's go ahead and click on the crashes metric, crashes. And then uh, I, I can configure this to change and apply advanced segments. I could change the date range, a bunch of stuff. But for you guys, we'll just use the default view. So go back, and boom. There you have daily crashes right there in the palm of your hand. Pretty cool. So here's a little story on the next feature that I think was really cool and is really applicable. Um, so for the keynote, you know, I was standing there in, in line with my buddy Antonio Rosso. And we're, we're sitting in this you know, line, and there's thousands of people around us. Uh, everybody's trying to get into the keynote for I.O. And we started to chat about how this year at I.O., the audience is bigger, things are better. He starts talking about the mobile application, about, oh, the new Google I.O. app is so much better, it's easier to use. And we look around and we're wondering, he asked me, you know, I wonder how many people are using the mobile app. So I look at him and I smile, and then I showed him this view, which is real-time reporting and analytics. Now, I probably don't have a connection here, and so you can't see the data. And because it's real time and there's no connection, you're not going to see the information here. But what we're doing is we're bringing real time up to the second reporting directly in the palm of your hands. And so at the time when we were looking at the data, we saw about 5,000 different people using that app right there. And I, I swear this works because I was sitting right here and I was looking at it the whole time, changing networks. Uh, and of course, when I have to do the demo, uh, there's no connection. Um, it's set up to work on the Google I.O. So, um, so it doesn't. So what, we're allow, what, we're, what we'll do here is uh, we'll show you a metric of the total number of users, whether it's in your website or your application. And so if you're at the movie theater looking at your metrics, if you're in a boardroom meeting and you're kind of sneaking a view, you have up to the minute uh, reports of what's going on on your site. Now in Google Analytics, there's over 200 metrics you can analyze. And that could be really difficult to analyze all that data on such a small device. A couple of years ago, we launched what we call Google Analytics Intelligence. Now, Google Analytics Intelligence mines all your data and finds statistically significant changes and shows those in a report. It's pretty much a what's changed report. So to make analysis easy on the device, we incorporated Google Analytics Intelligence directly in a view. And what this shows you is a list of the top things that have changed on your site, ordered by day, and by statistical significance. And so when you click on the first link, what we see is that in San Francisco, the number of sessions has increased by 500%. And that's an anomaly in our data set. You can see by the data over time graph that there's a huge increase of data right there. Now, when you're looking at this data, you might be, again, waiting to get on a plane, or you might be eating dinner, and you want us to share this with your team at home. So we made this easy to share by clicking this button. You can send this report to your team back at home. So that's a high-level view of the Google Analytics mobile application. The app is free. It will be available through Google Play within a couple hours. With that, I want to bring Neil back on stage. Thanks very much, Nick. So let's summarize. We've shown you Google Mo Mobile App Analytics which brings mobile applications as a first-class citizen into Google Analytics. If you go to this link, goo.gl-e-a-u-l-i, you can go ahead and sign up for the whitelist. Whitelist will be available in waves starting Monday, and the Good news that I have for all of you at I.O. is that you all at I.O. have preference over anyone else making it a wave. Right? Wait, so let's be clear. If you want to use this application tracking, this brand new stuff, sign up right now because a lot of other people will sign up and you guys will have preference. So. Yeah. Now when he says right now, wait till the session's over, all right? <laughs> Second thing we showed is, and so what'll happen is you'll get an email. 
Your user will then be enabled to actually go create app profiles. You can go download the SDK, look at the docs, create applications that use it, start sending that data, seeing reports, and so on. Okay, so it's all there. The second thing we have launched today is the Google Analytics Android app, which Nick just showed you and which we're really excited about. Here's the link for it. As Nick said, it should be available in the next couple of hours. There's a QR code, not too useful for those of you who are here, but if you happen to be streaming this, it might be useful as a way to get one. Okay. And with that, we thank you very much. So let's now open it up for questions. Just to let you know, by the way, Nick and I will be available after this session. We'll go out in the hallway, and then we'll make our way down to lunch. You're free to join us. Any questions? So let's go ahead with questions. Hi. Right here. Hi. Uh, so if I were already using um, uh, Google Analytics for my app, and there's already data, like a lot of uh, analytics information on, the, on there, uh, what's the migration path? Like, how, how do I migrate to? Uh, so you're already using thing. Google Analytics for mobile apps? Yes. So unfortunately, you really need to just switch over to using the new, and you're not going to be able to see your new and your old data. OK. Is there a plan, though, for the migration? So no, unfortunately, this was really just the old mobile SDK was sort of a labs feature. We don't have a migration. OK. All right, thanks. Hey, Question. Neil. The basic question, when you were on the dashboard for Google Play showing the traffic sources, do you have to input those choices manually, or does it auto-recognize where your traffic is coming from? So the traffic sources are auto-recognized for everything except the email campaign there. So in general, we have manual campaign tracking and auto-tracking that happens. Can I go back to those traffic sources and look at future retention? and actions from those traffic sources, or is it only showing me app open on the initial launch? So what happens is that when you have a traffic source, we, that information is maintained across the lifetime of that user. And so we can still see information, for instance, of what happens on those users yeah. in so, the future. Yeah. So if you have like in-app in transactions, you can then attribute that back to the original ad that sent them to download your app. Beautiful. That helps you with lifetime value and retention. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question. Hello. Uh, I've actually got two questions. Um, the first one is maybe a bit broad. Is Can you give an overview of how your service compares to your competitors, like Flurry? So. Uh, we provide a somewhat, well, we both are analytics, and we provide uh, ad additional features that. Well, the Google Play tie in, yeah, that one's. So let me back up a second. Um, <laughs> having multiple choices is good for, for users, and we're going to just let users decide which, which they prefer. OK. Uh, well, then the, the other question was more specifically about one of the features that they have is about you can tie parameters to events. Like when you have an event for the levels, been, the players just beaten a level, you can add statistics about how, what, how they did in that level. And um, when I last looked at Google Analytics, you could only say just kind of just an event. And the is there anything to allow to tie these extra parameters to it? We yeah, are look. Yeah, ahead. that's a great question. So we released a feature called Custom Variables that was uh, available in the previous SDK. And that's something that we're looking to bring also to the new SDK. So if you look at our documentation and read about custom variables, you'll see they give you the ability to add metadata around the type of stuff that you want to bring your business data into our product. OK, yeah, that's useful. Great. Hi, uh, my question is about pausing the application. So when the application, when user pauses the activity, say by pressing the uh, home key, is that considered as user leaving the screen? So when the user leaves the application, for instance, by going to the home screen, that is considered leaving that screen. That's yes. considered as a drop of the user. So the question as to whether that causes a new session or not yeah. is, is, is a, so we actually have a timing mechanism so that you can specify sort of how long the user is away from the app before we consider that a new session. Yeah. Is that uh, part of the SDK? Yes. OK, thanks. I actually have uh, two questions. So number one is, is there a limit to the number of events the client library will track per day? There's a limit of 500 requests per session. OK. And number two, is there an export API? So for example, if you came up with a 
new query that, for example, Google doesn't support right now, but you wanted to run against that data, do you have an export API to grab that data or no? Yeah, we do. We call it our core reporting API. And if you go to developers.google.com analytics, there's a lot of resources around how to use that. Okay. Just, Thank just you. to make clear, though, we do not export the raw data. Um, so we export summary, we export reports. Yeah. Okay. So aggregated data. Thank you. A question about the refer attribute or the receiver for from Google Play. Uh, we had some issues about this previously when you have various uh, people managing campaigns. The operating system sends one uh, receiver the value and not all the receivers. So you're in a unique place to, to kind of push back on that and say it needs to be a broadcast so that more than one receiver can get that information. It's true, it is kind of clumsy if you have multiple receivers associated with your application. I, I think I'm addressing your issue. If you have multiple receivers associated with your application, one of them gets it. So you really need to write sort of a meta receiver that then dispatches it to the others. It is kind of clumsy. Uh, and uh, we'll take that information back to the Android team. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, the question is about the Android Developer Console. Right now, there is some, are some stats there. What's the crossover between analytics and um, the console that you can see for your applications? We are trying to integrate that more. Okay. We're so working. will it be a subset or, you know? Yeah, well, we're looking at, so one of the stuff that Neil was talking about was deeper play integration, right? And so some of the metrics they're giving you there about how people engage on the site. And so right now, analytics gives you more in-app usage, uh, and then they give you more kind of within your listing on the actual play product. The integration that we're looking to do is give you holistic end-to-end -end, uh, measurement. So that way you have full visibility in how to you know, gain more people to come to your site, how you can optimize the copy in play, and get more people to download and transact. So these integrations are starting. Neil talked about some stuff that's coming out you know, looking forward a little bit, and then you can consider those integrations getting deeper and deeper. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, how, is it, how easy is it to uh, do cohort analysis, looking at user engagement um, over time, week to week, and things like that? Yeah, so for cohort analysis, we do show you the total number of users and mm -hmm. active users on the site. Um, it's something that we're looking at to give you the right, you know, to be able to segment them properly, because there's some deeper things that you need to do to do that. So it's something we're still looking at. Okay. And one more thing is, how real time is the data? Um, the real time is within a couple seconds when you have an internet connection. Mm. Okay. For the real time. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, what, yeah. Uh, what we say sometimes is, uh, at least for the, for the website, we know before the user knows. Right? So before the user sees the page, we can all already know that they've been there. Is there any plan to add support for other mobile platforms, like a Windows Phone or BlackBerry? We are looking into other platforms, yes. Thank There's you. a trade-off on market share, too. So you know, we want to go where developers are. <laughs> and we're also investigating ways in which third parties could provide that. Yeah. Um, can you explain how you define the concept of session and time spent, and how it's different from the web? So it's this, a session length consists of when you enter the first activity until you leave, until you, uh, let's make it clear. So it's a little complicated by the fact, of course, that on, on Android, your application is still running, even in the background, right? So it's when you leave an activity and don't start a new activity, and then stay out for, half, for some certain period of time. I think the default is 30 seconds, maybe, although I don't remember, and that is configurable. In addition, if you've got a period of inactivity for at least 30 minutes, that will also be considered stopping a session. Yeah. So, like, so like, if if the video, if you're playing a long form video, is that considered activity? Like, say, if you're watching like an hour long movie, and as there long isn't as you're making inactivity. tracking calls at least every 30 minutes then that'll be considered the same session. But you would probably, that's, that's a good example where you would want to explicitly make calls to, for instance, track the event that they're 15 minutes in, they're 30 minutes in, they're 45 minutes in, and so on. Yeah. So you can get some idea of how long they. Can I uh, label my users as a uh, custom cohort? 
Does the old segmentation feature of Google Analytics work? The segmentation features certainly work. Uh, if you want to be labeling them in the form of like custom variables, then no, that is not there. OK, uh, another question. I think the play integration is a killer feature, which, by the way, sets you apart from Flurry. Um, so two-part question. One, I would love to see more data coming from Google Play, like this cohort gives me a 30% lower rating than this other cohort. Um, and, and then the question is, is this exposed in a way that other SDKs could theoretically grab that data, maybe through the receiver or some other way? So the sh first off, that's very useful information about the, about the suggestion for the Google Play, things like uh, you know, uh, how, how well they rate and so on. The aggregated, in so there's a couple, a couple answers. So the aggregated information is certainly available via the export API. The receiver information is available to any application, so you can know uh, the campaign that caused them to get to Google Play. The actual information from Google Play, as terms of number of views and things like that, there's no API that I know of, at least at this point, and I don't know of any plans for one. Thanks. <laughs> hey, um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, are you planning to release the source code of the Analytics app for Android? Uh, the app for Android, the application to see your data? Probably not. Um, we have an API, and there's a lot of people who've built their kind of their own um, front end, uh, but for this one, we'll probably just own it ourselves. Okay. And also, is there a way to track uninstalls with the new features of the mobile analytics? There is currently no way to track uninstalls. That's not to say we might not be able to do that as part of a Google Play integration okay. in the future. Thank you. Is there any support for app widgets as part of the launch? Um, so the, the, we're providing the framework to do the tracking, and so that's some of the more documentation on how to use the framework to do that that we'll probably be looking to do it within the next couple quarters. Mm -hmm. So, so th there'll be more better support for that type of stuff in the future. Yeah. Yeah. But it can be used today. There's nothing that requires yeah. you to have activities in order to do tracking. Uh, there is sort of a lower level of just initialize the tracker and start making tracking calls, and you can certainly do that from a widget. Yeah. And oh, just to, there's a guy right here, Andrew, he's on our team, uh, and, and somebody maybe you want to talk to to figure out some of the use cases. What is the uh, minimum Android API required? That is a great question that I should know the answer to right off the top of my head. I believe it's 2.1. It's certainly no later than that. Does that work for you? No? OK. Yeah, in the XML uh, document, you, you have a debug mode, and you have like different settings, like the dispatch time. Is there a good way to set that? Uh, so like I have a debug application and a normal application? Is there a good way to like differentiate and not just keep switching the string for the ID, the string for the debug, the you dispatch? Can, yeah, I can understand where that XML, is. you want to be able to do it programmatically, yeah. perhaps. And you can certainly do it programmatically as well. So you could just leave that out of your XML file and then just make a programmatic call to either turn debug on or off based on the settings of whether like you're debug or not. An, an app start or something? Yeah, all of that stuff is also available programmatically. It's just intended, for the most part, to make it easier. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's take the last question. Hi. <clears throat> Earlier, you mentioned there's a 500 limit per session. What happens after you hit that? Does it just dump off the front end? Does it stop recording? So that uh, limitation is actually on the back end rather than in the SDK. And so what actually happens when you exceed 500 is undefined in practice. So, but it could change, you know, in an hour, uh, is it drops everything past the 500. Okay, thank you. Great. I'm not lying about that in my mind, no, okay. Thanks very much, we certainly appreciate it. We'll be out in the hallway if you have other questions. <laughs>